Thank you for viewing our virtual natural disaster preparedness course presented by the Tennessee Recovery Project. Who are we? The Tennessee Recovery Project is a program funded by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, designed to provide outreach cross crisis counseling services to persons impacted by disaster in counties, declared for individual assistance. Uh, FEMA DR 4637 has declared uh, Cheatham, Davidson, Dixon, and Stewart assistance due to a cat catastrophic tornadoes that occurred on December 11, 2021. Our mission is to provide telephonic and online emotional support, education assistance, and intervention to all persons experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, in regards to these grants, uh, we typically have service goals that we have to satisfy and complete. Uh, being able to do that either in person or virtually like this training we're offering. Um, in addition to that, we also offer uh, community networking and support. We also provide assessment and referral resource linkage. Uh, we also develop and distribute educational resources and media and public service announcements. Disclaimer. In this presentation, we will discuss further details on preparing for certain natural disasters that may have or will affect those who are participating in this course. So we understand the potential physical and mental tolls that result from these disasters. At any given time, if this presentation is becoming overwhelming by any means, please feel free to take a break if you need to close your computer or whatever you need to do to make you comfortable. Uh, we just want to put it out there that we are gonna be discussing some things. If you all have been impacted by a natural disaster, we just wanna create a safe space for you. So in this um, presentation, we have course objectives that we wanna go through. Um, the first one is being able to define and differentiate inclement weather versus natural disasters, being able to discuss and apply eight stages of the cycle of preparedness framework, being able to examine the importance of disaster preparedness, and to be able to utilize the framework to develop coping skills pre, post, inclement weather, or natural disaster. So the learning outcomes as a result of, result of participating in the Tennessee Recovery Project Natural Disaster Preparedness course, attendees will acquire knowledge to efficiently prepare themselves and family members for natural disasters before they strike. Weather explained. So did you know, per the Center of Research of Epidemiology of Disasters, Natural disasters affect 218 million people worldwide and claim 68,000 lives per year, according to a 30-year average from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Extreme heat is the number one weather fatality in the U.S., followed by deaths by flooding, tornadoes, lightning, and/or winter storms. Between 1953 and 2019, Tennessee reported 59 major disasters. The majority of the disasters are categorized as severe storms and floods according to the Federal Emergency Management Agency, which is FEMA. The Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, TEMA, reports Tennessee is exposed to the following disasters, drought, earthquake, extreme temperatures, severe weather, tornadoes, uh, terrorism, and uh, critical infrastructure. Weather explains. So when we hear the word um, inclement weather, uh, we typically have a general idea, but if we actually put that into a definition. Um, it can be defined as any severe or harsh weather condition that makes it unsafe or impartial to travel, commute, or be outdoors. Natural disasters, on the other hand, can be defined as an environmental phenomenon that have the potential to impact societies and the human environment. Natural disasters include all severe weather, which have the potential to pose a, a significant threat to human health and safety, property, critical infrastructure, and homeland security. Now, natural disasters are not to be confused with man-made hazards. All right, so in addition to this, this is usually an interactive slide that we do in person. Uh, we typically take the items and ask people um, at their table if they could just make a list and divide or categorize what they would place as a natural disaster versus uh, inclement weather. And so we're going to pass through this slide uh, just to keep the presentation going. All right, and so... Um, if you were able to do this um, activity, um, so when we talk about inclement weather, we have excessive rain, thunderstorms, and we refer to natural disasters. We have earthquake, heat wave, tornado, strong wind, flooding, and hurricane.
And so now we're going to turn it over uh, to Kenzie. She's going to talk more about the disaster preparedness framework. Thank you, BJ. So while preparing for disasters, be mindful that there is no one size fits all plan. Personalize your plan, including you and your family's needs. There will be a link to a brief introduction video attached below if you would like to review this as a resource. So FEMA has implemented the cycle of preparedness to help prevent, respond to, and recover from natural disasters. As you can see, this is the cycle of preparedness with the recommended eight steps to complete. We will be going into further detail regarding each step. Step one is identify all possible disaster scenarios in your area. According to an analysis from the ICF and Climate Central, Tennessee has more than 270,000 people living in areas at an elevated risk of inland flooding. More than 2.3 million or 37% of the state population of Tennessee citizens reside in areas that are at risk of wildfires. The risk of wildfires include dry conditions with low humidity, and strong winds. Debris and arson are the top contributors to Tennessee wildfires. So first and foremost, it is important to be aware of your surroundings within your residency. What natural disasters are you exposed to where you live? Ask yourself the following questions. Are you aware that you're living in a flood zone? Are you aware that your area has been hit with the most amount of tornadoes in the last decade? Did you know that your area receives the least amount of precipitation annually? Looking at specific disasters in your area will assist you with starting your personalized plan. It's helpful to look into current and past disasters throughout your area, as well as resources that may be able to assist you with any services needed. This may include your emergency management office, community centers, or even churches. Also following the local news and other community pages to stay in connection with any updates. The most important information about disasters and emergency management will come from your local officials and community leaders. Local governments plan, prepare, and respond to disasters with the support of the state and federal government. You can go to fema.gov slash locations, and that will help you find this information in your local area. Step two is make a list of possible damage that may occur to your property. Losing one's belongings during a natural disaster can be devastating as well as stressful when reporting to your insurance. Keeping a record of your inventory before a disaster will make filing an insurance claim easier. Consider making a list categorizing your belongings, including your home, vehicle, and or property. Making a list of belongings in your home may be overwhelming, so start by picking an easy spot like a cabinet or closet. When purchasing new items, continue to add to the already implemented list. Include basic information like descriptions regarding the physical condition of furniture or counting clothing by general categories. Record serial numbers if needed. Check coverage on big ticket items like jewelry or other collectibles. Do not forget to include items in storage that may not be at your specific location. For your vehicle, Make sure your car is in good condition in case evacuation is necessary. Preparing for your car may look like checking for any physical damage, completing routine maintenance, such as oil changes, tire pressure checks, and checking your transmission fluid. Make sure your vehicle has at least half a tank at all times in case of emergency. And lastly, review your lease agreement if you have one and review your insurance coverage. As previously mentioned, 
it is important to know what disasters may be susceptible in your area. Look into your owned property. Note the trees, utility poles, telephone lines, and other things that may fall causing damage. Review what your insurance covers for specific property damage. To ensure you are fully prepared for coverage regarding your belongings, it may be helpful to take photos or videos to record the physical appearance. Making sure that you write down full descriptions, including the year, make, and model numbers as needed. And for any valuable items, it may be helpful to receive an appraisal to note the item's worth. If possible, store your inventory somewhere it can be easily accessed after a disaster. And then step three is using the list, take actions to protect your property. So some natural disasters like tornadoes happen suddenly with little to no warning. It's important to have that action plan as how to protect your property, not only when a disaster arises, but in everyday life. Protecting your vital documents is an important step to assist with recovery and coverage as needed, not to mention the avoiding the tedious hassle to reobtain certain documents from the government or wherever it may be. These documents may include your social security, title to your home or car, your birth certificate, tax information, or even the list of belongings you made in the previous step. Some recommendations to keep your documents safe may include keeping them in a safe such as a waterproof or fireproof box or bank deposit box, or even leaving copies with trusted relatives or friends. You can also secure electronic copies with strong passwords and save to a flash or external hard drive to put in the safe or with your loved ones. Protecting your vehicle includes looking at the insurance coverage. Most cars have comprehensive insurance, also known as other than collision services. Comprehensive insurance covers for events that are out of your control. Examples may be vandalism, fires, fallen trees, or natural disasters. So making sure to store that vehicle policy number and contact information nearby, keeping your policy number, your insurance professional or company phone number, and claim filing instructions in a secure location, possibly with your other vital documents. While protecting your home, it is important to look into your insurance and see what it covers. If you know your area is prone to certain disasters, floods, tornadoes, anything else, talk to your insurance about a plan that suits you. If you own your home, standard homeowner's insurance policies usually provide coverage from disasters, including fires, lightning, hail, and explosions. Most homeowners insurance includes windstorms for tornadoes, but may cover a fraction. Coverage for floods are an insurance add-on with 2% of Tennessee citizens having flood insurance. If you are renting, consider getting renter's insurance. Aside from insuring your coverage, additional actions throughout your home may take place, including bringing all outdoor furniture that could be lifted by strong winds indoors. Check in weather strips for cracks or leaks and replace them to keep water out. Clear your gutters for, property, for proper evacuation for rainwater. Continue with routine home maintenance. Lift appliances a few inches off the ground to reduce risk of water damage in case of a flood replacing broken or loose roof shingles for better protection against storms, securing those external structures to the ground, such as sheds, porches, or carports, and also trimming tree limbs once a year so they don't fall on your home. 
and then upgrade your garage doors as needed to protect you from high wind. And then we will have Marissa discussing step four into further detail. Thanks, Kenzie. Um, so the first thing that you need to consider when building an emergency kit is how prepared you should be. Emergency kits can be classified in materials of three different levels, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. For any level of emergency kit, it should be stored in an easily accessible place and should be able to be transported in the case of a, quick, uh, a need for quick evacuation from your home. A good rule of thumb is to use backpacks, generally one for each member of your family, or a lightweight duffel bag for easy transport. Now you probably are asking yourself, where should I begin? There are several things to consider and questions to ask yourself when deciding what level of a kit is needed. Try considering the following. Who is this kit for? Are there any special needs to consider, such as pets, young children, medications, and or special circumstances? How many people will need this kit? What disasters happen in my area? Do you live in a fun flood zone, hurricane zone, tornado alley, or an area with lots of earthquakes? And how transportable should your kit be? Will you need to shelter in place or evacuate? Always be sure that your kit is in an easy to grab area like a cabinet or a closet close, close to an external door and there's nothing blocking your kit. Remember, disasters can pop up out of nowhere and you will need to grab your kit at a moment's notice. For a beginner level kit, the good news is most of the items in these kits can be found in your own home. Setting aside light items like extra water bottles, canned food items, Band-Aids, batteries, and tools such as pliers, wrenches, and manual can openers, not electric, in a backpack can help you give a good basis for an emergency kit at a low cost. Some other items like hand-powered radios, whistles, and dust masks can be easily found at your local grocery store or shopping center for affordable costs. Now, if you want to take it just a notch up, um, consider adding some of the following, such as toilet paper or hand sanitizer, more supplies for your first aid kit, such as gauze pads of various sizes, roller bandages, adhesive tapes, and a thermometer, extra clothes for inclement weather, such as gloves or hats or even rain jackets, blankets for any need of sheltering in place, local maps of the area in case your phone loses battery or is damaged or lost, a multi-purpose tool, and this can actually replace the pliers or wrenches from the basic kit and gives you a lot more options. Um, copies of any personal documents in a weatherproof bag. This is actually one of the more important items to add to your kit as these documents will be extremely helpful post-disaster. In the case of evacuation or loss of property, the originals could be destroyed or lost. Matches in a waterproof container, camping lanterns, glow sticks. Keep in mind to have one for each family member in case you do need to evacuate. It's great to have some sort of rope or something to tie it around as a necklace. Um, toiletries such as deodorant, toothpaste, and soap puzzles, games, and coloring books for kids just to help pass time if you are sheltering in place or you do have to evacuate to an unknown lo location. And if you want to make your kit even further enhanced, consider adding solar chargers with cables for your phones and or other devices, sleeping bags, signal flares, cash or tra traveler's checks in a weatherproof bag, in the case that your debit or credit cards are lost or damaged during the disaster. These can actually be used to pay for food or hotel rooms post-disaster. And if you need to save space, you could always put these in the same weatherproof bag your important documents are in. A fire extinguisher, ABC type is suggested. Reflective vests, again, one for each member of your family is suggested. A generator, a compass, and an extra set of car and or house keys in case you need to get back to your home. 
Now, what about your pets? Your pets are important members of your family as well, which is why they should be included in your family's emergency plan. Um, the good news is that prepping your pet for an emergency is pretty much the same as prepping yourself for an emergency by making a plan, building a kit, and staying informed with any changes to their routine. If you would like to look into further information for keeping your larger pets safe in the possibility of a disaster, please visit ready.gov forward slash pets for additional information regarding preparing your pets. Um, we do also have a short video for you guys to watch. This will be in the description of this video, um, and it's really helpful and kind of takes you uh, for visuals as to what an emergency kit would look like for your pets. Now, some things to consider is that your pet's behavior may change dramatically after a disaster. They could become aggressive or defensive. Be aware of their well-being and protect them from hazards to ensure the safety of other people and animals. Watch your animals closely and keep them under your direct control as fences and gates may have been damaged. Pets can become disoriented, particularly if the disaster affected certain scent markers that normally allow them to find their way home. Also be aware of any hazards at nose, paw, or hoof level, particularly debris, spilled chemicals, fertilizers, and other substances that might not seem as dangerous to humans. And as always, consult your veterinarian if any behavior problems persist. Um, when creating an emergency kit, please consider the needs not only of yourself, but for everyone else. If you or someone in your household has disabilities or other access and functional needs, please visit ready.gov forward slash disability for specific content and information regarding preparation for disasters. And again, this will be another video linked in the description, description that will help you figure out what sort of things to consider with these vulnerable populations. The best rule of thumb for keeping up with your kit is to check your emergency kit at least once a year before the season of your disaster is set to start. Examples of this is hurricane season, tornado season, et cetera. To ensure that you're as prepared as possible in the event of an emergency. Um, try to consider the following. Check the expiration date on food items and medications to make sure you're not past the date. The last thing you want during a disaster is to only have expired food to eat or medications that will not work. Check the batteries and flashlights, not only to make sure that they're not dead, but also that there's no corrosion. Ensuring that the receptacle for the kit is intact is imperative, especially for disasters where evacuation is necessary. Check the bag that the kit is in for any tears, broken zippers, or any severe wear. And when you check your kit, make sure your emergency plan still reflects your kit's location. This is especially important in a household with young kids. That way they can be prepared for any worst case scenarios. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Shauna to take you through an emergency uh, preparedness plan. Thank you, Marissa. Okay, moving on. Now we have hit step five, which is prepare a family plan for each type of disaster. So in preparing yourself for each type of disaster, it is important to understand types of disasters, firstly. Um, so hurricanes and storms are known to cause flooding. Some ways to prepare for the event of a hurricane or severe storm uh, may include to know where your electricity, gas, water switches, and valves are located and how to shut them off. Um, evaluate items stored in your basement, your furnace, water heater, and electric panel to higher floors if they uh, may pose risk during a flood. If you have a basement or lower level of your property prone to flooding, buy and install sump pumps, which back up power, and check them regularly for efficiency. Consider installing check valves in sewer traps to prevent flood water from backing up into drains in your home. Um, also consider using sandbags. They can divert water and placing them around doors or in flood prone areas is an effective way to keep flood water from seeping into a home during a hurricane. 
or flooding. This can be especially crucial during a storm surge. The sandbag should be stacked at least one foot high for adequate protection. Now moving on to earthquakes. Earthquakes, um, while in Tennessee, it is not common for earthquakes to happen, but we are no stranger to them either. If you find that your home is located in an earthquake zone, the best way to prepare is to secure heavy furniture to the walls with a bracket and be sure nothing near them can be damaged when they fall or if they fall. Earthquakes can be powerful enough to knock over heavy furniture, including appliances like a refrigerator, and these items can cause serious injuries, especially to young children. Now moving forward to wildfires, in areas prone to wildfires, creating a defensible zone area around your home and making use of non-flammable materials like cement and stone are some strategies that can protect your home. Plants in the yard can fuel the flames and spread the fire towards the house. So Cal Fire recommends planting fire retardant plants such as rock rose, ice plant, aloe, hedging roses, sumac, and shrub apples. Maple poplar and cherry trees tend to be less flammable than pine and fir trees. So that may be something else to consider when trying to prevent the spread of a wildfire. Moving on to wind hazards, the main damage from a wind hazard is exterior damage to your home and or windows. To maintain heating equipment, um, you want to consider cleaning your chimneys and have them inspected yearly. Make sure your home is properly insulated. Caulking and weather strip, stripping your doors and windows to keep the cold air out is also a good alternative uh, when trying to maintain heat in your home. Install storm windows and cover windows with plastic from the inside to provide insulation. Moving forward to extreme heat, install air conditioners snugly installing them if necessary. Um, you want to make sure that extreme heat uh, does not do any further damage to your home, such as roof damage. So in doing so, you want to consider maybe covering windows that receive morning or afternoon sun. Outdoor awnings and or blinds can reduce the heat that enters a home by up to 80%. Possible power outage. Prepare for power outages um, by charging your cell phones and electronics and setting your refrigerator and or freezer to its coldest settings. If you use electricity to get well water, fill your bathtub with water to use the flushing toilets. Um, you're able to put water that you have stored uh, maybe in your bathtub in maybe small bins. And then after you're able to use the bathroom, you can actually flush the toilet by dumping that water into the toilet. And unplug sensitive electronic equipment, which can help um, decrease the chances of a power outage. And then moving forward to uh, winter weather and extreme cold. Uh, the main damage that that poses to you and your home is ice damage and or bursting pipes. Um, so just maintain uh, proper insulation in your home. So now that you understand the disasters and you, that you have identified what disasters pose risk to you and your family, now it is time for you to establish a plan. Uh, so by going to evacuation-planner.com, you have access to creating your very own evacuation plan. This website will give you a step-by-step -step instructions on creating the perfect layout um, and plan for your family. On this slide, you're able to see some example evacuation plans uh, where you have the layout of a home, um, and then you're able to maybe talk through with your family where you will go in the midst of a disaster. What is your evacuation plan? You're able to physically see that on paper.
Now, evacuation in the midst of disaster may not always be an option, so it is important to plan for sheltering in place as well. Um, here are some tips for sheltering in place. Uh, so local authorities may not immediately be able to provide information on what is happening and or what you should do at that very point in time. Pay attention to local media outlets for official, ne for official news and instructions as they become available. Bring your family and pets inside. Lock doors, close windows, air vents, and fireplace dampers. Turn off fans, air conditioning, and or uh, forced air heating systems. Take your emergency supply kit, unless you have reason to believe it has been contaminated. Go into an interior room with, a, with very few windows if possible. Seal all your windows, doors, and air vents with thick plastic sheeting and duct tape. Consider measuring and cutting the sheeting in advance to save yourself time. Cut the plastic sheeting several inches wider than the openings and label each sheet. Duct tape plastic at, at the corners and then tape down all edges. And then lastly, be prepared to improvise and use what you have on hand to seal gaps so that you can create a barrier between yourself and any possible con contamination. Now, after step five, you have step six, which is to practice the family plan. There is a video, uh, but it will be linked at the end of this uh, course where you will be able to access it through a hyperlink. So putting your plans to the test, practice your evacuation plan or your shelter in place plans. Do that by practicing drills with your family. Be sure to take um, your time and time how long um, your plan takes to evacuate, I mean, to execute. And then step seven, evaluate your results. So are there any changes that need to be made to your plan? If so, um, consider making these questions and getting answers to them. What did you like? What didn't you like? Is your plan realistic and doable in the midst of a disaster? Do you, does your plan um, address everyone in the household? Do you believe your plan covers everything needed? Just remember that during this step, this is your time to alter your plan if anything that you feel fits your family the best. And now step eight is to share your plan with family and friends. So sharing your emerge, sharing your plan of action, uh, which goes for you, your family, and or even your pets. So that means sharing your emergency contacts. Pick and choose multiple reliable contacts to share your meeting location or disaster plans with. Share pertinent information or close con close contacts um, would need to know to better assist you in the midst of a disaster. And now we will go over the importance of disaster preparedness, but I'll pass that on uh, to our crisis counselor, Kayla, for more. Thanks, Shauna. So the importance of disaster preparedness, um, proper planning and prevention can reduce the catastrophic impact of natural disasters on communities, but particularly vulnerable populations. Every step in emergency management matters. Um, having a system in place to properly identify and prevent potential disasters to having a strategy for handling the response and recovery. Proper planning and response could mean the difference between life and death. There was a study focusing on the lack of disaster preparedness and the uh, researchers stated that for many Americans, it is not a question of if you're going to be impacted by a disaster, but when. From the research that they collected, the data that they collected, um, a belief in the usefulness of prepar preparing for disasters was associated with being at least adequately prepared. The average American lacks the knowledge of ability or ability to adequately prepare for a severe storm or natural disasters, despite feeling confident about the proper procedures. The survey of participants um, who had received the information related to disaster preparedness within the last six months were more likely to be prepared. So the goal is that 
Disaster preparedness, it, it's very important and it's something that we should continually to educate ourselves on and refresh our memory on items that we may need or um, information that we need to gain. We have talked about the physical side of preparation and planning for a natural disaster. Now we would like to take a moment and discuss the mental health side of prepare, prepping and coping, both pre and post of a natural disaster. The verbiage coping skill or coping strategies is interchangeably used and the definition states that they are an action, a series of actions or a thought process used in meeting a stressful or unpleasant situation and modifying one's reaction to the situation. Coping strategies typically involve a conscious and direct approach to problems. However, they can be healthy and unhealthy coping categories. Some of the healthy ones are self-soothing, relaxing, a distracting activity, social support, and professional support. Some of the unhealthy ones can be negative self-talk, harmful activities, social withdrawal, and suicidality. Some of the most common unhealthy coping mechanisms are avoiding issues sleeping too much, excessive drug use or alcohol use, impulsive spending over, over or under eating. It was stated that it is easier to revert back to unhealthy coping mechanisms. We do it automatically. We are predisposed to relying on negative coping skills. It is important to check in with yourself routinely to determine if you're employing healthy coping skills. So we're talking about healthy coping skills and here we have kind of a list um, that I previously talked about on the slide before. But for those that may not know what, the, what a coping, uh, a healthy coping skill is or some activities that they could do as healthy coping skills, here's a list. Self-soothing, which can be means of comfor comforting yourself through your five senses. Some need a distraction, which can take your mind off the problem for a while. Opposed opposite action, action, doing something opposite of your impulse, but consistent with the positive emotion. Emotional awareness, tools for identifying and expressing your feelings. Mindfulness is simply being present in that exact moment. And when all of these um, healthy coping skills that I've listed before may not work, there is the crisis plan. Um, it is creating a plan filled with contact info of supports and resources. Now that we have a good idea of what is a coping skill and unhealthy and healthy coping skills, let's talk about coping after a disaster. We know that it can be easy practicing these skills under everyday normal situations, but after a disaster, it can prove to be quite difficult. Following a disaster, most people will ultimately do well and return to their previous level of functioning. However, if you do not, it's okay. Identifying and understanding that these reactions are normal after a disaster is the first step. Some of these reactions can be, but are not limited to, disbelief and shock, fear and anxiety about the future, disorientation, difficulty making decisions or concentrating, nightmares and reoccurring thoughts and events, Sadness and depression, feeling powerless, changes in eating patterns, and actually even physical changes like headaches, back pains, and stomach problems. But the good news is that while these are some of the common reactions, here are some tips for helping um, revert those feelings and those reactions. Talk about it. By talking with others about the event, you can re relieve the stress and realize that others are sharing your same feelings. Limit exposure to images of the disaster. Watching or reading the news about the event over and over again will only increase your stress. Instead, replace it with fun activities or find time um, for activities that you enjoy, such as reading a book, go for a walk, catch a movie, or do something else you find enjoyable. Remember, take one thing at a time. For people under stress, an ordinary workload can sometimes seem unbearable. Pick one urgent task and work on it. 
Once you have accomplished that task, choose the next one. Checking off tasks will give you a sense of accomplishment and make things feel less overwhelming. And then finally, ask for help when you need it. If you have strong feelings that will not go away, or if you feel troubled for longer than four to six weeks, you may want to seek professional help. Being unable to manage your response to a disaster and resume your regular activities may be symptoms of post-traumatic stress, post stress disorder, a real and treatable illness. Help is available. Make an appointment with the mental health professional to discuss how well you are coping with the recent events. You could also join a support group. Don't try to cope alone. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. We have talked about um, common reaction in adults, but let's kind of change gears into common reactions with children. While most of the list that you saw with adults does apply to children as well, here are a few that um, you will find more in children. Very young children may become clingy, feel fearful, have tantrums, or resume behaviors such as bedwetting or thumb sucking. School age kids may get into fights, socially isolate, or have trouble with schoolwork. Adolescents and teens may use alcohol, tobacco, drugs, or prescription medications to try and cope. However, by creating a supportive environment where children feel safe asking questions and believe, that, and believe that their concerns are being heard, we can help them cope through this stressful time. Here are a few steps that could assist um, children and adolescents um, during this time. Use words and concepts children can understand. Make time and encourage kids to ask questions. Be prepared to repeat information and explanations several times. Acknowledge and validate the child's thoughts, feelings, and reactions. Be, assured, be reassuring, but do not make unrealistic promises. And finally, one of the bigger things is be aware of how you respond to tragedy and talk about it with other adults. Children are always listening. Um, so how you react can tend to show them how they will react. It's a modeling behavior. Here we have a few exercises that you may be able to take part in and, and utilize. Um, for the sake of this presentation being that it's virtual, we will not be able to necessarily go through the entire um, exercise with you. But uh, if you look where it says, listen to me and click on that, there is some wonderful um, soft music in the background to help you relax and you can follow through um, these different exercises and see if one of them works for you. If not, definitely if you look inside um, the weather preparedness guide, which will be on the website, there is options there that you can utilize as well. So um, if you have any questions um, about anything that you have seen or um, heard in this presentation or questions that might have not been in the slide that you were looking for, please do not hesitate. We This is our information. We have a hotline available and our number is there from Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 p.m. If we do not answer, we will make it our business to return that call between 24 to 48 hours. There is a voicemail. Um, you can also email us and this is our direct box at Tennessee Recovery Project at centerstone.org. And then um, again, this is our website here at the bottom. If you would like a copy um, of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, if you would like a PDF copy of the weather preparedness instructional guide that goes along with this presentation, please visit the website to download a free copy. Um, and that is also another avenue for you to connect with us and talk to us and let us know what you would like to hear more about. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Um, and engage in this presentation. Um, and we wish you the best and thank you.